Hi, and welcome back to the Healthy and Happy podcast series. Um, I'm joined with a special guest today. This is Heather Trote, who is the owner of High, High Thrive Coaching, um, mother of eight, best-selling author, and a good friend of mine. And um, I'm super excited to have you here, Heather. So welcome. I'm excited and grateful, Denim. Thanks. This is going to be fun. Hopefully it's helpful for some people. Yeah, I'm, sure <laughs> I'm appreciative you. of your work. Uh, thanks. We're we're talking about core this month, and um, for those of you that might be listening that are not familiar with core, core is uh, the personality profiling system that I've developed that um, really gets at the underlying motivation of why we do the things that we do. And core is an acronym, uh, each letter standing for one of the personality types, uh, temperament types, and um, and we're going to be talking about R today, which stands for resolution. Um, and Heather is an R, um, a primary R. Uh, most most people. So again, just a little bit of education. Um, temp- temperament is a little bit different from personality in that temperament is typically defined as a, a set of characteristics or traits that we come into life with that um, are part of who we are and um, and temperament doesn't change. There, there are actually nine temperament variables that have been identified in the literature and, um, and as an infant comes into life, he or she can be high or low on each of those nine traits and the core temperament model, the core, the core temperaments um, are a compilation of highs and lows on each of those um, traits. And, and so everybody comes into life with a primary type. And then uh, most people have a pretty dominant secondary type um, that, that really helps to kind of shape how the primary type works um, or looks. And so um, Heather, why don't we just kind of start? Um, what are your thoughts on core and on R in particular? Yeah, well, I'm grateful that I was able to find um, a little bit about core several years ago. I was actually working with Carrie MacArthur, uh, who works with you, Denim, and she was helping me see that, you know, I think that you're probably this temperament type, but I don't want to tell you who you are. So why don't you fill out Denim's quiz thing and let's see what's going on there? Because she was seeing that my husband was feeling kind of bulldozed, unheard. I was feeling misunderstood and I was also really uncomfortable with who I really am, I think was the biggest thing. I felt kind of like I was shaming myself for being so driven and being so results oriented, which is an R. And I felt like I should be more like a C. And I felt like I should be more nurturing. I should be more like about connection and comfort and closeness and like softness. And, and I just am not. (laughs) So, uh, So I took the quiz and sure enough, very dominant R with a secondary C. I think it was like 82% or something R. And uh, and then the rest was C and then a tiny bit of O and zero E. So um, sorry guys, if you've taken the, the E, the, the, you know, the core temperament and you're an E type, I do not get you like, at all. <laughs> and, uh, I actually really struggle still sometimes with relationships with ease. So mm-hmm. it's helped me though, um, understand myself better and help me to just own who I am so that I'm not trying to shame myself for being something that I thought I should be from my culture, religious culture, family culture, um, you know, and, and just being like, well, this is who I am. And then learning the difference between a healthy, a healthy R and maybe some of the parts of me that weren't as healthy and then how to strengthen those to become healthier. So that's helped me understand myself better. And it's definitely helped my relationships. I do kind of go into doctor mode sometimes and like try to diagnose people and like (laughs) determine who they like, what temperament type they are, which I don't know if that's the best thing to do (laughs) more often than not. If I can, I'd be like, just go take the quiz and then tell me what you are. (laughs) Right. Although it is kind of, I mean, obviously we talk a lot about it at my house and um, it, it really kind of filters through most of, of what I do. You, you bring up something that I think is so, so important. And, and one of the things that I really hope 
people get out of core, which is so many of us, you know, we live in a society where certain traits and, and characteristics attributes are kind of held as the way to be, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, there's a way that, that we think we're supposed to be. And, and if you don't happen to fit within that kind of preconceived model, then it's really normal and, and common to feel like there must be something wrong with me right? I, I'm supposed to be soft and fuzzy and, and, and kind of more C-ish and, and you're an R and, and just to talk a little bit more about R. So R stands for resolution and R's biggest contribution. I believe that R's bring to society is movement. Um, R's are really good at creating movement at getting things done. Um, R's tend to be list makers they um, they feel things really passionately. The the resolution piece to to our um, isn't like uh, most ours don't get a lot of satisfaction at like a finished product. They don't do something and then look at it and say, "Oh, I just love what I've done here." It's when something <laughs> is not done, when something is unresolved, it creates emotional strain for the R whether it's lost keys or a project that's not finished or a trip that's not planned or whatever, whatever's on the R radar, if it's undone, it creates emotional stress. And so when that thing gets resolved, it also resolves that emotional stress. And, and that is what really drives or propels the R is like getting that, I don't know what to call it, angst or like um, getting that resolved by create, by getting things done. And, um, and so ours are, are really fantastic at creating movement and, and moving things forward and bring so many important things to society. Um, but frequently uh, are not that, you know, the strengths of, of ours typically aren't what, um, you know, what, what a lot of women think, they should be, or a lot of society would, would hail. And, and the, the fact is that, um, that you're not broken, right? In fact, I mean, I, I admire you a, a great deal and, and the strengths that you have and, um, you know, you're, you're a much better R than trying to be something else. Right. And so I, I just, you know, that's one of the things if, if you, if you feel like, if you feel shame about how you are, um, then, man, come take core and learn that it's okay to be you and how to be a healthy you. So I, that's, that's a really good point. Um, how do you feel like, like core or understanding your temperament um, or your kids or your husband has affected your relationships? Yeah. in so many ways. Um, so like one of the things that would drive my husband crazy is we would be on a vacation and he is an O um, at OC. And so he's totally present, you know, he's just soaking in all the fun. And I'm like, this is awesome. The next vacation, let's do this. And then let's do that. And he's like, can we just be here now? (laughs) And I'm like, well, I am here now, but I'm also like, I love this. I want more of this. Let's talk about more. Let's talk about the next one. (laughs) So that's just a small example of like, that we're we felt like we're like never on the same page, you know, like, cause he's so like centered and like present is what I want to call it. And, and then I'm always like future, future, future. And sometimes he's like, can we just be here now? So he helps ground me um, and helps me like have some presence and helps calm my, my brain down so that I can um, be more in the moment. Uh, and then I also bring, you know, those strengths of, of vision and momentum and, um, and drive and, um, you know, I'm more the, like the visionary and I, I've come to see that as a great strength. Um, but it also can create some disconnection when we're kind of threatening each other's like core needs, like our temperaments, um, primary drives and desires, yeah. right? He wants he fun. He wants like spontaneity and I want like planning and checklists and getting stuff done. And so um, when we don't really understand that that's what's going on for us, that can create a lot of tension and a lot of unhappiness, a lot of judgment, a lot of misunderstanding, miscommunication, and kind of feeling like we're getting more and more disconnected over the years yeah. definitely was where we were at 
you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and even just not knowing how to really conflict, um, resolve conflict, right. Which I know I've, I've learned a lot from your CPR <laughs> as well. Um, before I would push to get things resolved quickly, because that's that emotional tension, right? Oh, yes. It causes me like right? so much stress if it's unresolved. So I'm not the kind of person that I can just sweep something under the rug uh, or just be like, do the silent treatment thing. Or, you know, uh, if I know something is wrong, then we got to hash it out and we got to do it now. At least that's the way that I would handle it in the past. Right. Uh, because it's so stressful for me. I can't go to bed and then have us have a fight and not have it like worked out because then I can't sleep and nothing like in my life will work because it takes up the whole screen. It's like, all I can see, it's all I can think about. It just consumes me um, and is very emotionally challenging. Uh, And then my husband's complete opposite. So with the OC-ness, he likes to internally process things. He likes to take time to understand things. He wants to be thoughtful in his responses. He wants to see it from these different sides before he addresses it. And he wants to make sure that uh, when he does talk about it, he does it in a way that's going to um, be the best for everyone involved. Whereas I'm more like, I'll plow through things just to get it resolved. Yeah. And that definitely like looked like in the past, a lot of explosiveness, you know, just like whatever it took to get the thing fixed quickly was what I cared about. And I know that might sound kind of like heartless. (laughs) Not at all. And it is somewhat that I'm not really considering as much. And I didn't as much um, in the past about like what he was really needing or wanting. It felt to me like when he wanted to take time to process through things and take time to address an issue between us or a big fight that I was being abandoned. Like he didn't care. That was the story that I started telling myself was like, well, if he really cared about me, he would want me to feel better and work it out instead of just letting it go for days. To me, it felt like weeks or like, Sometimes I feel like he would never even talk about it ever. Right. And <laughs> he may not have. <laughs> right. He might, yeah, he might have been just as happy not to. Have. Yeah. Yeah. So I think us just knowing that about each other has really helped us find some middle ground. So what we do now is I'll be like, when in the next 24 hours can we talk about this? Perfect. So it's not right away. It's not like in the next breath that I would prefer. Um, but it's also not waiting weeks before we ever talk about it or leaving me feeling like, are we ever going to talk about it? Cause that creates so much, um, stress there. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're, you need to get, yeah. Go ahead. Do you mind if I pause no, no, no. real quick and come back? Okay. Hopefully you can edit it. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right. Um, everything okay? Yeah. Good. A couple of things that I want to highlight there. You hit on some really important things. You hit on one of the most challenging aspects of your, um, of your relationship dynamic. Um, so your, your RC-ness and his OC-ness, um, one of the, you kind of made reference to it, but ours are the only temperament type that live in the future. And, um, and so ours are by the time the present catches up to wherever they are, the, our brain is already onto the next thing. Um, and, and that again, pulls us forward, right? It's part of what makes and plays to the, our strengths is that it, this pulls us forward. Well, the O lives in the present. And, and so one of the weaknesses or challenges of the, of an O and I'm an O I'm an OC, so I can totally relate to this, um, is O's have a really difficult time planning because O's are driven by fun and by wanting the emotional climate to be positive and pleasant. And so O's have a really difficult time planning something because they don't know how they're going to feel next month or, you know, next Christmas, or maybe even this evening. 
And so they, they don't want to, to commit to something. And then when the time comes, not feel like doing it. And so it, it's really difficult for, o, for the O-brain to plan. And it is like the lifeblood of the R-brain to be able to. And so um, that really creates a very natural kind of conflict between the R and the O default um, functioning. And so by understanding that about, about the way each of you work, it can, it can enable you to be able to, to assign different meanings to those tendencies because the tendencies can't change. And that's, and that's a really important piece of this is that temperament does not change. It's been studied for decades and consistently been shown to not change. And so there are a lot of things in life that we can change, but you cannot change your underlying temperament, which fuels why you do the things you do and why you don't do the things you don't do. And so you can, you can try like crazy to make him a, an avid planner and he can try like crazy to keep you from wanting to do that. And it's that tendency is never going to change. And, and so by understanding that about yourselves, you can then, you can then assign a different meaning. And so, and then instead of him, like just being difficult or, um, or making your life difficult or, or abandoning you, you can reinterpret those things. And instead of him thinking that, ah, she won't, she can't enjoy this right now, or she's, you know, she's always got to be on to the next thing. He can under, he can assign a different meaning that helps him accurately know how to interpret what you do. And that's a super powerful, super powerful thing. Yeah. It. it really takes a lot of the drama out of it. And like you said, in signing a new meaning, when I understood that it's not that he doesn't care, which was the story I was telling myself, that was the meaning I was giving to his way of handling things, yeah. his temperament was very personal and very hurting. You know, that was a really hard thing to say. Like he doesn't care about me. And I built that up for several, you know, many years actually to the point where I was like, I don't even know if he like loves well, me. Really, like yeah. how can he love me? He says he does when he doesn't talk to me about things and he won't resolve things yeah, that exactly. R word again, resolution. Exactly. <laughs> and then when I realized like, okay, he just processes things differently than I do. And I can give him that, like I can give him that grace and he can give me the grace that this is how I process things. Exactly. And, and work, and, and then you can develop skills. So, so, you know, what do you do if, if the way that you're, cause every, every, every temperament type has things that are naturally kind of lined up or conducive with what healthy is. And everyone has things that are incongruent with what healthy is. And so, you can't just say, well, you know, I'm an O and so I'm never going to plan anything, right? Because you have to plan in order to be successful in life. And so, or you can't just say, well, I'm an R and so I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to fight right now, whether you want to or not, right? I mean, you can't. So, so when, when healthy is incongruent with, with who you are, then the research shows that you can develop a skill, a process or a partnership to help us do what we need to do to be healthy. That doesn't come naturally to us. And, and you, you hit on a really, a really good one, which is in resolving conflict. Another really common, common problem for that RO dynamic, because O's O's drive for positive emotion. So, so his O and his C neither like conflict, right? <laughs> for reasons, but O's don't like conflict because it's unpleasant, and and C's don't like un conflict because it's uncomfortable, and so he's got both of those, making it really difficult for him to want to engage in conflict, and and again, one of the one of the great strengths of the R is that almost everything that comes in the R brain makes it out the R mouth. Yes. <laughs> um, which, which I love. My wife is also an R um, and I love because openness or, or um, vulnerability is one of the things, another thing that the research has shown to be really important in creating trust in a relationship. And, um, and, and openness is defined as what percentage of what goes on inside of me, do you have access to? And with an R, that's naturally really high. Mm -hmm. 
you don't you you seldom have to guess what an R is thinking or feeling. Feeling, yes. Because <laughs> they they share it. And so you're not like wondering, well, what's back there? What what else am I missing here? Because what comes what comes in here <laughs> comes out here. And and so that that creates that creates a, a, a challenging dynamic when you can't get resolution. And so for you to say, okay. I'm fine to not do it right now, but you got to give me something within the next 24 hours when I'm, when I can predictably get some resolution, Mm -hmm. gives him time to prepare and, you know, kind of gives him some space. It also gives you something that, you know, you're going to be able to do to move it forward. That's a really good example of, of implementing a process and some skills into your marriage to help you be more healthy. That's yeah. That's really good. Yeah. It's been truly, truly changing for us. And in that way that we can actually resolve things in a way that works for both of us um, and, and build a move forward. And I know that Ben and I are both grateful (laughs) that we're able to find that, that tool now. um, So that reduces a lot of that tension. Um, Another thing that comes up is in mothering. So I am a mom of eight kids and I kind of always felt like I just need to be like, I don't know, Holly homemaker or something (laughs) and just be like super nurturing and just have like, I don't know, just closeness and connection, more of that seeness. And I'm just really about getting stuff done a lot more than that. And I felt like, am I just not a good mom? And a little more of that, like, you know, blaming or self-judgment kind of coming in. Um, and that I like to do things with my kids. I like to go out and do something. And that's how I connect with them. I, I do things as we're moving. And, and I don't, when we're just in the house all together, I just, I don't know. I don't feel like, I, like I don't know. That. I just don't connect in that way. Um, and so finally, like learning not to shame myself about that and to let go of <laughs> needing to be a C or something as a mom and be like, you know, I like working on goals with my kids. I like saying, here's what we're going to do today. And then we have a project and we get to work and we have fun doing it. <laughs> that's fun to me. Uh, and that's how I, you know, build connection with them. And now we're homeschooling and our entire modality is like goals that drive you. Cause they're all different temperament types. Of course, um, definitely have an O son, have a, an RC son as well. And then, um, a little bit of a son with an O O E, And, um, yeah, so, you know, each of those are different. And then my daughters are younger. I'm not quite sure. I know you're able to tell with some of your younger kids a little bit more what they are. Um, but yeah, I definitely have a daughter. It's an OC probably. And so there's different things that are going to motivate them, you know, and me understanding what drives them and why they do the things they do. Mm -hmm. And we all have goals, but we're going to go about them in different ways and do them for different reasons. So I think that that's kind of a way that I found as a mother and also as a homeschooler with like being in charge of their learning that works really good. I keep it in in the structure of like, let's have a goal. (laughs) Like, so let's work towards something here, but let's do it in a way that, that works for you. Um, You know, for my son with the, with the E tendency, that's got to be like, I need a structure. I need a course. I need a manual. And then my son, that's more of an, Oh, it's much more fluid. It's a lot more spontaneous. And I've learned that it's okay that he has almost like probably very little R in him and very little E in him. And so he is going to be a lot more spontaneous. Like his dad, he's going to want a lot more flexibility. And so instead of making him try to like fit my mold of what it needs to be like understanding that his mold is his mold and, and I can be okay with that. It's really helped um, them to succeed and flourish in their, who they really are. And they're learning a lot more and I'm learning a lot from them, seeing them grow into that, you know, instead of trying to force them to do it in a certain way that I felt like they had to do it. Right. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's really good. I, and, and one of the benefits of, of, you know, if, if you're homeschooling successfully, that's one of the benefits of that are the traditional school system works really well for certain people and certain kids. Um, and, and it, but you know, if you're teaching a class of 30 kids, you can't, you know, you can't do individualized instruction to everybody. And, and so it, um, it's, it's difficult. And so being able to adapt like that is, is really good. It's yeah. It's been illuminating. Um, do you, I don't know how to ask that. 
what what have you noticed or or maybe changed or thought about in terms of like emotional regulation and um and your the way your your brain works yeah i think having that awareness of what's going on there and then noticing when i do slip into some of the more unhealthy like bulldozing or just pushing <laughs> pushing 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 to get something done um just noticing when those kind of things come up so emotional regulation, like when I notice that it feels very, I think you call it disorganized emotionally, yeah. when I feel like a lot of stress or just a lot of overwhelm looking at like, what, where is that coming from? And what do I need to do to get back to a good place? Um, and then really leaning into those strengths of what does work really well for me. So I know that like structure schedules, checklists, those things are all my friends. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, like this morning, the schedule got interrupted because my husband's car needed to be fixed. And then that was emotionally like <laughs> disorganized. Yeah. It took me a minute to be like, okay, now I can only get these things, these couple of thing results done this morning. Which ones are they going to be? I can't get them all done. So yeah. I'm going to have to leave some unresolved. <laughs> And you're going to have to just be okay with that, Heather. <laughs> well, and knowing, you know, having, knowing what, what you're having the structure to know what is on your list, then you can, you can adapt when you need to, which is really good too. Yeah. And ours, uh, ours do tend to, to shift gears pretty, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, ours, ours typically don't sit on something that they can't create movement on. If, if it's, it's actually typically really important for, for an R to act when something is on the screen, because if, um, if an R doesn't feel like they can create movement on something, their brain doesn't like to stay there and they like to shift over to something that they can move. That's and true. so it's, it's really important to be able to create movement, act on something when it, when it does have your attention, because you mentioned it earlier whatever is on the R screen takes up the whole screen. Yeah. <laughs> it's all I've ever felt. It's all I've ever thought. It's all I've ever, it's, 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 it's consuming. Um, and if you can't do anything about it in 10 minutes, there will be something else that is equally as consuming. <laughs> um, and so it, it's, uh, it's really uh, an important aspect of, of being a healthy R to understand that about yourself, that, that you're going to be, to move, you're going to move to something that you can move on. Right. And that whole, like taking up the whole screen is so true. Um, ben calls it like tunnel vision, but yeah, that's what it is. It's like, this is, I'm sorry. This is just the only thing I can think about. And um, until I shift to something else. And if I can think about it, then I am thinking about how do I resolve it? What do I need to do here? And so if maybe you're married to an R or you have an an R in your life. And you're like, why are they so fixated on something? Like it's because their brain is like, I've got to resolve this thing. And they're thinking about all the plans and the different reasons and who, what to do and how to, who to talk to and um, to get it, to get things moving. And like you said, to take action quickly. And then if we can't, you're right. Then we switch to something else that we know we can, yeah. <laughs> or at least we try to do that. Right. And sometimes I know I've heard you say this, like we'll have like a couple different things that we're working on only one takes up the screen at a time, but we'll shift from one to another, to another, to another. So yeah, I always have like four or five goals and yeah, this is my time to go on this one. Okay. And then this one, and then this one. Yeah. That's so true. <laughs> that's really good. And I, and I think you're, I think you're a good example of like taking, taking what you've learned about your temperament and, and really capitalizing on it. I, I think, I think you use your artness to get more done, even like if, yes. if that makes sense. You know, you've, you've taken that, that, that strength and, and been able to like, um, really capitalize on it. And instead of hitting your head against it, um, I, I think you're really working with it, which is, which is a really good example also. Yeah. Thanks. It feels good to own it. It feels good to say, yeah, these are my strengths and I can let them be strengths instead of putting myself down about them or worried about what other people will think. I'm definitely an anomaly in some of my extended family members. 
Like, why is she so driven? Why can't she just be a mom and be home with her kids? Like, <laughs> like kind of the feeling like that, you know? Uh, and so it's okay to say, you know, no, I do want to own a seven figure business. And I do, and I do want to write books and I do want to create in, in these ways. I do want to connect with thought leaders and build, you know, amazing platforms to help change. Um, I'm driven by that. And it's important to me and to know that that's good. And it's good for my kids to see that I'm who I am. Um, and that it doesn't mean I'm any less of a mom or any less of a woman or anything. It just means that I'm being who, who I am. Um, and I've heard the other side too, you know, sometimes like a C will want to be more like an R and think I need to be more goalie oriented or I need to be more, more driven, or I need to be more successful in the workplace or whatever. And they're like, but that just doesn't really speak to me. And so whatever type we are, it is really just recognizing that these are my strengths. Yes. This is why I'm here. This is what brings me joy instead of trying to fit some other mold. Right. And it, it, it is really, especially in the kind of the realm of, of self-help and, and improvement there, there's a lot of like, this is the way you're supposed to be. And this is the way to be successful. And um, and how, how a C is successful is different than how an E is successful or, or how an R is successful. And, and, and they all, if you just step back and think about, you know, what each type brings to society and what would be missing if that weren't there, um, there are unique things that, that each of us brings that we need to bring. You know, you're, especially if you're an anomaly, what you bring to your extended family is unique mm -hmm. and, and probably blesses that whole system uh, with your strengths that, that would leave a void if, if you weren't showing up as you. And right. it's, uh, it's, it's easy when, when you worry or you feel like your strengths aren't valued, it's easy to try to not, um, to not engage or kind of not, not spotlight those things that we feel, um, you know, aren't being appreciated. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot from ours is feeling like they're really big. Mm. Um, like they, cause, cause ours energy is big. It's, you know, our, you typically know when an R walks in a room, um, the R energy is, is quick. It's intense. Ours are really good on their feet. Normally they're pretty good in an argument normally, because they're most of the, of the processing that an R does is external. Yes. Um, it's, it's, uh, again, it's, you know, what comes in comes out. And so it's, it's important for ours to be able to process externally. And, and one of the strengths of that is that they, they're, they're quick on their feet, but a lot of times around, um, more internal processors, C's and E's both tend to be more internally internal process oriented, if that's how you say that. Um, a lot of times ours will feel like they're really big in, mm -hmm. in those kinds of settings. I don't, have you experienced any of that? Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I felt like I'm too big for my husband. Like my dreams are too big. My vision's too big. Yeah. Even sometimes the presence in the room, like, like if I just walked in here and I feel like, like, why is everyone like looking at it? It's just, right. why is everyone looking at me? Like, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, just taking up, um, a lot of space or even in, you know, in a meeting, yeah. making sure that my voice isn't crowding out other people that everyone feels heard as well. Um, that my ideas aren't the only ideas, of course, all those different things. Um, and so I always check myself in some of those situations with some of those relationships having had feedback that you didn't really feel heard there, or, you know, um, I didn't feel like you really, really like understanding. And so that's something I'm continually working on is to make sure that I am understanding, but yeah, I do have a big vision and to someone that's going to be more about comfort and security, like my husband with the Zenus, uh, that can be threatening. And then sometimes his need for comfort and security is threatening to my need to grow and expand and move things. Cycling, right. Right. So it kind of feels like sometimes we've got engines pulling two different directions. Um, but when we really, again, put kind of down the story and understand where we're both coming from, then we find a way that works for both of us. And uh, you talked about externally processing things. That's completely true. I always have to talk it out. And as I'm talking, that helps me figure it out. Um, I don't do a lot of like internal talking as much, 
I do sometimes with the sinus that I have a little bit, but my husband's definitely the internal processor. And so even that, right. So he doesn't want to do it too soon. He wants to think about it. He wants to process it internally (laughs) and I want to talk it out loud right away. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So just knowing that those are the differences that we have, but then finding what really works for both of us is helpful. So let me back up a little bit too. Um, as you were growing up and, and as you've been in intimate kind of close relationships with people, um, what, what felt good to you in terms of how, how people interfaced with you or what does feel good to you as, as people interface with you emotionally? What do you mean interface emotionally? Um, yeah, I'm still struggling with how to ask that. Sometimes <laughs> words wrapped around like how to that. connect emotionally or yeah, how to communicate yeah, about yeah. things. So, yeah. So I, so where my brain was going is, so parenting an R is pretty different than parenting a C. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to kind of talk about that from the other oh, okay. side, like being parented as an R or being loved as an R. Um, but I don't know how to ask that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So I know that one of the things that just obviously fills me up and you can call this love language or whatever is words of affirmation to say like, you did a good job. Like you did a good job basically getting whatever result that was. (laughs) 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 So I know that from, you know, my parents um, and both of them have, I I guessing they haven't taken your assessment yet, but have are in them as well. um, And some C. And so, uh, that was definitely something that was valued was setting goals and accomplishing things and working towards things and being successful in whatever that was that we determined we wanted to be successful about. Um, But then it also felt really good to have a lot of nurturing and a lot of the C comfort and the C closeness and connection. um, So that it didn't have to be always about what I was doing, but just who I am just to be loved for who I was. Um, So it was a mix of both of those. I felt like really, motivated for, uh, words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. And that was an interesting dynamic coming into my marriage because, um, in my husband's family, words of affirmation were like actually a negative thing. Mm -hmm. Like you should only be loved for who you are, never what you do. Uh So they would never get praised for like what they did only for who they were. And so in my marriage, I've kind of felt like I did a really great job, like doing this thing, like, you know, say good job. That's not a bad thing to say you did a good job. (laughs) (laughs) So it was an interesting dynamic kind of shifting, you know, family culture, family values, family ways of expressing affection and and stuff like that um, to then, you know, I think we all have that when we get married with our spouse, they come from a wholly, totally different set of, you know, background and even, yeah, yeah. exactly. So navigating that. um, But yeah. I, I do remember oftentimes as a kid being like, look what I did and still, you know, maybe not getting that. And then that always felt really deflating yeah. <laughs> and I've learned maybe to n- not worry so much about other people praising me or saying good job for something and just finding that inner satisfaction of, I know I did a good job and that's what really matters. Yeah. But as a kid, that was definitely something that was motivating or driving me for good and maybe not so good some of the healthy side and not some of the healthy side. Yeah. yeah. I also, I also think that it's, it's actually really healthy to ask for what, what you want. What you want. Yeah. Um, what you feel like you need. Because love, when, when you love somebody, um, a really, a really central part of love is being willing to do something that, you know, the other person values. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called altru- altruistic love. And, and it's, it's a really important part of helping us feel like we matter to one another. And, um, and so the vulnerability of saying, Hey, you know, I, I need you to tell me that I did a good job here, or, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate it. If you, you know, if you gave me some kudos on this, Mm -hmm. that kind of vulnerability is really good in a relationship. And then, and then the other person being willing to, to see that vulnerability and then feed that really helps to, to bring, um, to bring a sense of mattering into the relationship. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Um, 
in, so we have, uh, um, I have five kids, but we, we have four that are, that are here. We, we have a son that we lost and, and the four that are here, um, each one is a different primary type. My oldest daughter is, is an E she's an EO. My second daughter is an, is an OR. Um, my, my, my son is, uh, is an RO and then our, our youngest, um, Eric is a C. So we have each of the, each of the primary types and, and parenting. So, so the girls, um, the girls are, are off at school and, and we have a 12 year old and a seven year old at home. And, and Will, our 12-year-old, is an R, and parenting an R um, is very different than parenting a C. And um, with, with Will and his R-ness, we can have pretty heated arguments. And, and he'll, you know, another tendency of the R is to meet resistance with equal or greater resistance. resistance yeah. <laughs> push into an R, they push, they push back and, and up. Um, mm-hmm. that's just the natural tendency. I mean, even if you just like, if you physically push them, um, <laughs> or if you emotionally push them, that the, the default is to meet resistance with equal or greater resistance. And so even in, in parenting will, you know, he'll, he'll come back with, with some pretty intense resistance. Um, and, and we can have a pretty heated argument and then the, our brain gets over things really quickly because they live in the future. The R's get over things quicker than anything. Now, now you've got an interesting combination with your RC-ness because mm-hmm. R's are the quickest to get over things and C's are, um, are typically not so quick when they feel like things are unsettled emotionally. Um, so I, I'd be interested to kind of ferret out some of how that plays out in your life. Um, but, but so Will can get over things really quickly and then he's totally fine and we're totally fine. But Eric, in his in his little sea heart, his feelings are really big, and he feels things really intensely. And um, and then when when uh, when his feelings get hurt, it takes him time to recover. And so we we have to be much more careful um, about the way that we we parent Eric. But I also worry sometimes that um, because of what I understand about Will, I wonder if I'm not as careful as I ought to be sometimes in my interface with him. I think sometimes I take his artness for (laughs) for granted, maybe. (laughs) Well, we all do the best we can as parents, right? I can totally relate to the explosiveness though. And the meeting resistance with equal or greater resistance. There is definitely, I think that's one thing about an R is like, we don't actually mind confrontation if it means getting to resolution, we're willing to face it and to go like full out. Um, the C in me definitely doesn't like confrontation. So there's some of inner battle there. Um, and I'll say something and then I'll go into like, Oh no, like, what did I just do? And so I do have, you know, some of that processing that, that goes on between the t- different temperament types, I think in myself. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we do tend to get over things quickly though. And that's one of the beautiful things. We're really quick to forgive We're forgive. We're quick to move on. We don't really like dwelling on the past. I know one of my, I don't know if you call it weakness, but one of the challenges, I don't have a lot of detail memory. I don't know if that's just me personally, or if that's really common, but, um, like Ben will remember things that we said in conversation 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I'll be like, I don't even remember that happening. That's like about a trip he went on. And I'm like, I don't even remember you going like, I don't know. <laughs> that's just me, but I so much in the future that I, I feel like I don't give a lot of um, weight to things that happened in the past. Um, so I do tend to want to resolve it and then move on and, and to forgive and to, like, okay, well, that's where that happened, but where are we going? Right. So what matters to me more is like, where are we going rather than where have we been? Yeah. It's one of the things that I, one of the things I love most about, about ours is that, you know, forgiveness and really ability to change and and move, um, move on from, from what's happened. It's a, it's a really, it's a really positive trait. How do you cope with the the internal kind of tug of war between your R and your C. (laughs) 
<laughs> it does feel like that. It feels sometimes like two different <laughs> voices in my head, <laughs> but they are, it is that conflict. And all those years ago when Carrie first started talking to me, she's like, I think 